Welcome to the complete web developer roadmap. Becoming a web developer is a great idea, even in this year of 2024, with all the AI hype and everything, the web developer job is still not going anywhere in the upcoming decade. In this full guide we'll look at how you can go from complete beginner, whether you're student or intern, to landing your first developer job. If you already have a job, we'll look at what you need to learn to advance your position in your current company or get hired by a new one. And then we'll also cover the skills you need to go from mid-level to a senior position and get yourself a six-figure salary position. I will cover all the languages and tools for front-end, back-end and full-stack web development to provide you with a complete overview. And some people might visualize this roadmap differently, but this is what I would do if I started to learn web development from zero. Below the video you will also find timestamps, so you can jump right into the parts that are the most interesting to you. And with that, let's get started. The first part on our roadmap is understanding how the web works, meaning how the browser and servers communicate to display the web content on the user's screen. Here you'll learn about domain name servers or DNS, which are like the internet's form book, connecting domain names that we know to the IP addresses that the web uses. You'll also learn about HTTP and HTTPS protocols, which are the foundational protocols that browsers and servers use to send and receive requests. After that, you need to set up your workspace. This involves installing your code editor or IDE and getting familiar with it. Some popular ones are VS Code, WebStorm, Sublime Text, Atom and there are more. I recommend VS Code because it's the most popular one, which means that it has a lot of ongoing support for extensions and features. But choose the one that you like because this is the tool where you'll spend most of your coding hours. And then we'll need to enhance your setup with extensions and helper tools. For example, tools like Prettier for code formatting, or auto open and close tag extensions, auto importers, and live server. These will boost your productivity and streamline your coding processes. You also need to learn about basic terminal commands and how to navigate in the terminal, which will be helpful for various tasks from running scripts and starting servers to version control. Once you have your workspace set up and IDE, you can start coding and we'll start with HTML, which is the cornerstone of web content. Here you will learn about HTML tags which are used to create the structure of a website. Tags like headings, paragraphs, links and there are much more. You'll learn about HTML forms which are used for the user interactions on the web. Accessibility is about ensuring your websites are usable by everyone, including people with disabilities, which also helps us improve overall user experience. And semantics involves using the correct tags to provide meaning and structure, and this helps in readability and also benefits search engine optimization and accessibility. I would learn HTML in parallel with CSS, because I think it makes much more sense that way. CSS is the styling language that brings beauty to the structure of your HTML. For example, with CSS layout, you can control how elements are placed and organized on a screen. This includes CSS grid, flexbox for one directional positioning, floats and box models, which are used for creating responsive layouts that work on any device. Next, we have animations that add life to your web pages with transitions and movements to capture users' attention. We also need to make sure that our website looks great on any screen and that is the responsive UI part which is using flexible grids, layouts and media queries to adapt your pages to large screens, laptops, tablets and even the smallest screen phones. CSS variables are used when you want to streamline how you manage and reuse styles across your website. For instance, they are useful when you want to define a theme of colors for the website or create a dark light mode and so on. In projects where CSS gets complicated, some companies use preprocessors like SAS, Stylus, Less, and there are more tools to make style sheets more maintainable and easier to read. But you don't always have to write CSS for every component from scratch. Some companies, especially the small ones, use frameworks like Bootstrap, Tailwind, Skeleton, and other tools to speed up their development processes and not focus too much on styling. This is the CSS part of our journey. Next, I would learn JavaScript, which makes the websites functional and allows users to interact with them. 
Although this part may seem overwhelming, it's essential to not skip the fundamentals as having a strong understanding of JavaScript will help you a lot throughout the upcoming parts of the journey in the web development. So we need to start with the basics and that is understanding the syntax and concepts like data types in JavaScript or how to define variables and functions, how to use conditional statements and write loops. These building blocks will help you write functional scripts for your web pages. Next, we have asynchronous JavaScript. Since JavaScript is a single threaded language, it handles operations that take time like fetching data or waiting for user events asynchronously with the help of event loop, and this helps to keep our apps responsive. In this part, you'll learn about how the event loop works and how we resolve promises and timers. Memory leaks are also a common topic in JavaScript and learning this will help you optimize your web apps and prevent common issues that can slow down or even crash your websites. You will also learn about web APIs. For example, you'll learn about DOM and how to manipulate HTML elements on the screen, how to fetch data with the fetch API, and while working on the fetch, you'll also learn the most commonly used data format for web APIs like JSON, XML, and gRPC. Next web API is local storage for saving data in the browser and service workers which add offline functionality and can handle heavy operations outside of the main thread. And I18 is the practice of designing your web applications so they can be adapted for different languages and regions. ESLint is just a helper tool to keep your code clean and consistent and this automatically identifies problems and suggests fixes. The next part is modules that help us organize code into common JS or ES6 modules and help in managing and maintaining our code base, allowing us to reuse code and manage dependencies. You'll learn about build tools like Webpack or Bubble. These help us bundle those modules into a single file and transpile new JavaScript syntax into a form that older browsers can also understand. And lastly here we have the browser dev tools that allows you to test and debug your JavaScript in real time, inspect elements and analyze performance to optimize your web pages. The next part after learning JavaScript is to learn TypeScript, which is a superset of JavaScript that adds static typing to the language and enhances the development experience with type safety and advanced object-oriented features. In fact, 90% of the projects that I worked in recent years were written in TypeScript, and in my opinion, most companies looking for JavaScript developers now are also looking for someone with TypeScript knowledge as well. Here you will learn about the differences between static and dynamic typed languages, TypeScript allows us for checking type correctness at compile time and reduces the typical runtime errors that we usually get with JavaScript. And it does it by allowing us to define custom types and interfaces to enforce certain structures for objects and classes. Here you'll also learn about object-oriented programming and functional programming. You can learn these while studying JavaScript as well, but I think it makes more sense here after you know one statically typed language like TypeScript to understand the difference fully. Next topic is generics and decorators. Generics allow us to create components that work with any type, not just one, and decorators provide a way to add annotations and the metaprogramming syntax for class declarations and their members. And utility types are commonly used in TypeScript applications that allow you to transform and reuse existing types by adding or removing some properties from them. So after you also learn TypeScript, the next logical thing is to learn Virgil Control. This is how you would share and receive updates from your colleagues. The naive way would be to compress a zip folder of the code changes you made and send it to them. But this approach has many issues. First, they won't know which files and lines of code you have changed, and if two or more people are working on the same part of the code, this will quickly become a mess. And for that, we have the kit, which is the most common Virgil control tool. This is the tool you'll use to manage all these updates to your code. It lets you track changes, revert to previous stages, and work on different features without messing up your main project. And we also have GitHub, GitLab or Bitbucket and other tools. Think of these platforms as social networks for your code. These are where you can store your Git repositories online, collaborate with others and even showcase your work to potential employees. 
Next up is the package management, which is how we manage all those tools and libraries that the project needs. For example, you might need to add a routing package to your application, a CSS preprocessor, or Lodash for utility functions, moment or date for dealing with dates, Axios for making HTTP requests, D3 for creating complex visualizations, and much more. These are all managed by a package manager, and popular package managers are npm, yarn, and pnpm. These can get pre-made code packages for you to help your project do more things without writing extra code yourself. After we are done with package management as well, the final major topic you need to learn to land your first tech job is front-end frameworks. These provide us pre-written code that helps you build fast, responsive, and interacting web applications with less effort instead of writing everything from scratch with pure JavaScript. Popular options are Angular, Vue, Svelte, or React. Each of these has its own strengths and weaknesses, but React still remains the most popular choice in 2024 in terms of usage and open developer positions. This is also what I would personally learn if I start it over, because it has the highest number of job openings and is the fastest way to get started. So when starting with React, first thing you need to do is learn lifecycle hooks, these are the life cycles of React components and include mounting phase, update phase, and the unmount phase. This will help us manage resources and data during the component's life cycle. Next, we have hooks, which are just functions that let you hook into React state and life cycle features from function components. They have changed how we write components and broad simplicity. For example, performance hooks like use memo, use callback help in optimizing your components to prevent unnecessary renders. We have the ref hooks, for example use ref for referencing elements and use imperative handle to expose imperative methods to parent components. We have context hooks such as use context which simplifies the way we handle state across multiple components. We have some state hooks like use state or use reducer for helping us with state management. And lastly, we have effect hooks, use effect, use layout effect, or use insertion effect, which help us to perform side effects in the functional component. React also has a couple of built-in APIs, like memo, lazy for optimizing your components, and forward ref and create context for advanced functionalities. Similarly, we have a couple of built-in components like profiler for performance measurements, suspense for data fetching, and strict mode for detecting potential problems and more. Next part is the CSS in JS, which is just a pattern that lets us write CSS directly within our JavaScript code and it means you can scope your styles to components and leverage JavaScript's power to dynamically generate styles and avoid style collisions. Hawk stands for higher order components, which are a React pattern used for reusing component logic. They are functions that take a component and return a new component by wrapping the original one and extending its capability. And you'll also learn about server-side rendering versus single-page applications. Server-side rendering can provide faster initial load times and SEO benefits, while SPA or single-page application offers a better user experience. These are like the production-level frameworks of React, and in fact React started to offer this as a starting point to build your applications, but still you have to learn pure React, and then these frameworks are pretty easy to pick up after that. Next part is state management. While React has its own state management logic with context API, complex applications may require external libraries like Redux, Sustant, Recoil, and others. Redux is a powerful library for managing up state globally with a single immutable state tree and predictable state updates. However, it requires a lot of boilerplate code to set up actions, and lately we have new lightweight alternatives that are becoming more popular in small to medium-sized projects. For example, Zustan is a minimalistic library that simplifies state management using a simple set of functions, making it easy to use without much boilerplate code. Or Recoil provides a more React-like state management approach with atoms and selectors. We have Jotai, which offers a primitive and flexible way of managing state. And lastly, you can transition to React Native Developer if you know React. And in my last projects, for example, they used React on the website and React Native in the mobile app. 
Why? Because this is a very cost effective for companies. They can keep the same web developers team who work both on front end up and the mobile app at the same time. Of course, you are going to be paid more than just a front end developer if you know both React and React Native. But that's just a side note and it's not required at all to become a full stack developer. So after learning React, the final steps before you land your first tech job is interview preparation. This stage is all about making sure you stand out as a candidate and are ready to showcase your skills and knowledge in interview. Here you need to learn about how to structure your CV. Your CV is your first impression and we need to make sure that it's clean, professional and highlights your web development skills, projects and any relevant experience. Ideally, this should be one page long. Most people confuse CVs with their life story and start to put everything they can. But CV should be the opposite of that. It should highlight only the relevant skills that you have for the job and exclude all the non-relevant parts to help HRs and recruiters understand your position. Next, you need to find and apply for these jobs. You need to avoid the mistakes that almost 90% of developers make and because of which they get ghosted by recruiters or never get a reply on their applications. Here, there are two common approaches, high volume or tailored applications. With the first one, you send your CV to as many companies and positions as you can and focus on the volume. And on the opposite, you pick about 10 targeted companies and do as much personalization for them as possible. Both of these worked well for me in the past and I think the personalized approach is better, but it's good to know both ways. So then you need to use job boards, company websites and networking to find these opportunities. After that, you need to prepare for non-technical interviews. This should be the easiest one. This is usually called an HR interview and you just need to present yourself and talk about your relevant skills and experiences if you have any. These interviews assess your soft skills such as communication, problem solving and their team fit. Usually you will discuss your experiences and what you bring to the team beyond technical abilities. Next, you need to prepare for technical interviews. This can be either a live coding session or technical Q&A. There might also be a system design part, but this is usually very rare if you're just applying for a junior position or even middle level position. So you just need to practice common web dev problems and review your fundamental knowledge that you just learned. And the last part is to learn how to negotiate your salary. And this is an important skill. You need to know industry salary standards and be prepared to discuss salary expectations. Some people are afraid to discuss this because they think the company may change their mind and not hire them. For example, I didn't negotiate my first role salary and later I found out that I could have requested three times more for that same role. And after that I negotiated every role salary before accepting it and knowing negotiation techniques will help you a lot here. It's not just about the number but also the overall compensation package. And after you both agree on the terms of the contract, you can accept the offer and land your first tech developer job in the industry. There is a lot more to learn to move forward from here to mid-level full stack developer. And since this video is getting a bit long, let's discuss the next steps in the next video. If you're interested in learning more about the next steps in this roadmap or if you'd like to dive deeper into each part of it, then consider subscribing and we will be covering the transition from junior to mid-level full-stack developer in the next part of this roadmap. See you there.